comes to thunderstorms, tornadoes, thunderstorms for me. How many of you just get in the car and or did, maybe you can't anymore, but did <laughs> go and try to chase them and, and, and just see what you could see? I mean, I used to, because I, I primarily uh, grew up on Long Island, still live there, and I used to run down to Jones Beach constantly to watch uh, thunderstorms out over the water. Um, whenever there is a tropical system, especially if it's near the coast, I, and then Bill goes down there, I see the same pictures from Bill Corbell. Uh, we go down there and we start snapping pictures of the water coming all the way up to the boardwalk or how high it gets up there. And it's just in you. You just need to do this. So this is what Quincy does. Quincy is a freelance storm chaser. And the, you know, the thrill of experience of tornado or chase at close range, as we say, can be both breathtaking and dangerous. I remember a time, I used to live in Bayside also for a while, and I would see thunderstorms coming in from the northwest. And when I saw lightning strike the Whitestone Bridge, that's pretty cool. When I saw thunderstorms and lightning strike the broads of that bridge, I said, it's time to get down off the roof. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm sure you've got some experiences like that as well. Uh, I just want to give you a little history about, uh, about Quincy Bagel. He is a meteorologist and storm chaser who travels around the country documenting and researching all of the severe weather. He's been on TV here in Connecticut, WTNH. He was also on in WREX in Rockford, Illinois, and as well as the Weather Channel 2. And uh, you have your BS, I understand, a BS in meteorology right here from Western Connecticut State University, graduated in 2009, and you showed some footage of the fifth annual conference. I did not get to see that one, but this should be fascinating to see some of this stuff. And what, uh, what, what he wrote here was, I've been in numerous severe weather outbreaks taking hours each day to analyze, predict, and watch them unfold. And it, uh, he talks about the, uh, the tornado outbreak in 2014. I just now back to full-time storm chasing once again. Here's Quincy Bagel. Very active for severe weather. 
It was about a two-week period from very late April to mid-May where there were very few tornadoes. So if you storm chase full-time, get ready for gaps because there were a couple other years that also had slow periods in May. So even though May is the peak, climatologically, it doesn't always mean you'll see a tornado every day. And then there's also the off days where you don't see tornadoes and you have to stay entertained, and I was my way in Wyoming, staying entertained. But, so behind the storm chase, there's a lot of data analysis that goes into storm chasing. Storm, some storm chasers might just go out there and hope you get lucky. I actually spend, or I try to spend hours a day, usually the morning of, analyzing one of the things. One of the biggest things I look at are soundings. In addition to soundings, has anyone ever seen one of these before? A vertical wind profile, so you can see the wind from the, lower, the lowest level of the atmosphere all the way up. And these are helpful because many airports across the country have these, and they're updated about every five or ten minutes. So when I'm storm chasing in the field, maybe I don't want to wait 12 hours for the next sounding, I'll kind of look at this for wind. So vertical wind profiles are pretty important. Obviously surface analysis, spend time looking at that to see where the warm front is, where the dry line is, and a lot of things like that. The mesoanalysis has become one of my best friends, and this is actually that day in Kansas where I missed the Indiana tornado outbreak. So even though those parameters are kind of maxed out over Kansas and Missouri, there still was enough shear and other parameters that went line for it. In Indiana. So, what kind of ingredients go into forming tornadoes in severe weather? In other words, these are the things that I look for when I'm getting ready for my storm chase. So, instability, buoyancy, and usually that's measured in CAPE or lifted index. Obviously, you want to have that rising air so you can form the really intense up drafts that come with those supercells. And wind shear is pretty important because we don't have enough wind shear, which is a change in direction and speed of wind with height. So an example would be if you have a southeasterly wind in a lower atmosphere, you might have a north or a westerly or southwesterly wind in the mid-upper levels. And that will help maintain your updraft rotation. But you also need a for forcing mechanism to kind of trigger these supercell thunderstorms. On a small scale, it could be a front. A lot of times we'll have a cold front, warm front, or a dry line. Obviously, an outflow boundary is also another small scale for forcing mechanism. And one that I learned too is upslope flow. So when you're chasing the high plains, like in Wyoming, eastern Colorado, you might get a day where there's no distinguishable dry line or front, but if you just get a light easterly flow up the mountains, Colorado's pretty quirky when it comes to the weather. But then you also might have a large-scale force forcing mechanism, so usually it's an upper-level trough that's coming through. So red flags, these are, these are things that if I see them, maybe I'm not so confident in severe weather for the day. Extensive cloud cover, that's going to limit your ability to heat the boundary layer and have those higher heat values. If you have weak winds aloft, so if there's inadequate shear, usually my benchmark, if you look at a zero to six kilometer layer, you want to have at least 30 knots of shear. If there's less than that, you're probably not going to see much severe weather. And if you don't have strong enough winds aloft, you're going to have poor updraft ventilation. And obviously, very low level winds. Supercells are less likely if you have a unidirectional wind profile. So if the winds near the surface are west, and your upper level winds are also west, you don't really have much wind shear there. It's also difficult to maintain storm rotation in that case. Some other red flags, or loss rates. And if you're a storm enthusiast in the Northeast, you probably hear about this a lot. You might get good low level loss rates, but those mid level loss rates, from 700 millibar to 500 millibar, because we don't get the elevated mixed layer up here in the Northeast that much, a lot of times poor mid level loss rates. It also means if you look at a skew T diagram, which I'll show later on, to so have lower cape values because there's less to the right of curve. And then if you have limited boundary layer moisture, that's also going to not be a good thing. There's a large temperature dew point spread, so if the dew point is 55 and the temperature is 90 at the surface, that's not favorable for severe weather. And lower dew points too, so usually you want to have at least in the 60s, but I mentioned before Colorado's a little bit quirky. You can get tornadoes with dew points below the 50s in eastern Colorado. It's, it may only be in the 60s at the surface. It's, Definitely, definitely different out there. And then capping. So if you have a warm <coughs> level in the atmosphere, usually in the levels around 700 millibars, that cap will actually prevent thunderstorms from the updrafts from gaining height in the atmosphere. So the updrafts fail to form, and you don't get anything here. So I just kind of pulled a random sounding this year from Albany. I guess this was June 29th. Is this a favorable, favorable or unfavorable sounding for severe weather? What do you think? Yes. It's very unfavorable for a lot of reasons. I mean, you can see the wind profile is kind of unidirectional. Your winds are basically west throughout the entire column. You have a little bit of a cap. 
a little bit of a cap around Cesar Zillabar. Your dew point's only in the 50s. So, and then if you're familiar with a hodograph, usually for severe weather, you want to get a big moving hodograph for severe weather. It's kind of like a swash spider. You're probably not going to get super settled. It's kind of my analogy there for that. And another thing I'll use a lot when I'm storm chasing is the satellite imagery. It's real time. I'm not looking at models. I kind of just want to see where's our Q field forming. But the great thing about storm chasing out the plains is that usually you can see 50 to 100 miles. You can usually see cumulus developing way before you get those thunderstorms. And then obviously radar is another real time case that I use that. So I may spend all morning looking at my analysis, but then I may pick up chase target, and I may end up sitting there for several hours. So I'm say entertaining again, so I brought you in that case. But, but there's also dangers that go into storm chasing as well. So this is a map created by Jeremy Perez. It's basically a storm chase map, and the bright green color is an area where there's a grid road network. So you have like a grid road. You have, basically every mile or less, you have a road. And it's also flat. In the east here, so this is the plains basically of good chase terrain. Once you get to these teals, you have more trees. And then once you get over here, this is not even documented because there's so many trees and urban areas that it's just not favorable for chasing. So I, I basically say if you're not in this bright green area, good luck trying to storm chase. There's less roads out here in the high plains. You have hills in the Ozarks. And there's just too many trees, cities, and traffic in the east to really storm chase. I mean, if you live on a hill or if you know some spots, you could. Kind of maybe intercept a storm, but it's not too easy to storm chase up here. And then road conditions can also be a danger. There's something called a minimum maintenance road, and basically this road is just dirt. And it's fine if it's dry, but you get any rain at all, and you get inches of mud. And I've been stuck my, more than my fair share of time on those minimum maintenance roads. But road conditions, obviously, if there's dirt roads, it doesn't go well when you have heavy rain. Flooding's an issue. There's always construction, detours. And then there may be storm debris on the road from a previous storm, and that's going to make it hard to storm chase as well. Traffic, so urban areas can be nightmares. I chased near Kansas City and St. Louis, and it's, it's tough, and it can be dangerous for you and others. If, there's, if there are storms, you have emergency vehicles that want to get through, or you may get stuck in traffic, and um, you just don't want to be stuck in traffic if there's a tornado coming. Uh, rush hour causes delays, and usually that's your peak heating is usually four or five seconds close to rush hour. And then storm chaser convergence is a real thing. If you're storm chasing out in May in Oval and Kansas, there's hundreds of chasers out there. So I kind of like it later in the season, like July and August, there's not as many people that cause traffic issues on the roads. Now, what's another danger? This is a case I was chasing June 17, 2014, and storms can quickly change direction. So these are tornado paths. Usually tornadoes would go in a relatively straight line. They may curve towards the end of the life cycle, but during this storm chase, we had I was actually set up on this road, and this one tornado was coming towards me, and it just kind of moved around. And this one was anti-cyclonic, I believe, and did kind of the hook here. So, and if you if you recall the El Reno tornado a few years ago, where unfortunately a few chasers did die, that storm kind of quickly changed direction. So that's that's definitely a real danger when you're out there. Now, what about radar? So radar would be helpful, right? Well. I found a lot of times that the horizon doesn't really cover LTE in Colorado, so I get all these warnings saying you can't get data connection. I've actually gone on chases where I may go two or three hours with no radar. But luckily, I'm in the plane, so I pretty much see what's coming, but it is always helpful to get a better idea. And then as far as radar goes, this map, if it's yellow, there's poor radar coverage, and if it's red, basically, there's no radar coverage. So the east, the east coast is not too bad. There's a few gaps here and there. Actually, Philadelphia has a kind of a radar gap. If you look at the plains here, there's a really big gap in southeastern Colorado, the Oklahoma can't handle it. There's almost no radar coverage. And then northern plains, there's big gaps as well. Probably one of the two of the other really big gaps are in Missouri. I know, I think, I think it told me they have like a little radar here, but it doesn't show up on like a radar scope and stuff. But then another glaring radar hole is northeast of, of Dallas. And they get a lot of tornadoes. They're actually in the heart of Tornado Alley, so. Radar is great. But it may not happen. So all that happens, and then eventually patients will pay off. And this is actually a picture from Mineola of Kansas on May 24th. I was sitting in this field for about four hours before I even saw the first cumulus field starting to bubble up. So here's a special sounding from Dodge City at 19 Z, so 2 p.m. local time. And as I mentioned before, there's kind of a little bit of graph, so that's a, a good sign for severe weather. The only thing that's kind of limiting severe weather is you have 
big area of cave. Surface cave is over 4,000. You have over 2,000 mixed layer cave. Good wind shear. There's backing winds near the low level of the atmosphere, but there is a bit of a cap. So at 2 p.m., it was still kind of early. Storms didn't really get fired until about half to 5 p.m. And this was the midday um, shape or tornado outlook from the SBC and Dodge City is right about there. So I was targeting sort of southwest Kansas. <coughs> I kind of a well paid relationship with Eastern Colorado, so I decided not to go with there. I think the new points were probably in the 50s that day, and I wasn't too confident on tornadoes up there. But so to kind of set the stage, I started the day in Dodge City, kind of in the awe, and was basically just waiting for this actual boundary, which you can kind of see here straight across southwest Kansas and northwest Oklahoma. Because the outflow boundary is where you may look the storm initiation. And a short time later, the SBC issued their data watch for the day. And to give a little bit more background as, as the setup was going on here, so focusing on Kansas here. At 500 millibars, this modest flow about 40 knots, it's enough. There's a little bit of trough coming through. But what's really standing out here with the low level, so this is 22Z, and this is mixed layer cave. So there's already 4,000 joules per kilogram of mixed layer cave kind of fleeting into the inflow region here. Surface based cave was like almost 6,000 at this point. And then the winds were really back, so southeast winds. So this frame alone kind of tells me this is pretty favorable for severe weather this day. So round one of this storm chase was, I would call it closing in, 5.49 p.m. Had a little bit of a ragged walk out here. It didn't look too dramatic at this point, but it's kind of the beginning of this storm chase. And then by 5.53, I don't believe this is a model. It's kind of just a little hanging appendage, but the LCLs, the cloud base, was really low, well, talking like maybe three or 400 meters. So it wouldn't take much for something to spin up. And I have some videos to show you as the chase really begins to go underway. Now, I took the audio out because there's a lot of wind noise, and some of the videos are sped up, so you guys want to get the lunch. So there's no audio in these videos, so that even picture is kind of fun kind of as well. So you can click on the screen. We started here at 5.57 p.m. Go back. I think we can click on displays. Good. All right. So this video, the, there's a funnel cloud that's just beginning to touch down at 5.57 p.m. This is near you know, Mineola, Kansas, which is roughly about a half hour southwest of Dodge City. So, so when I storm chase, I actually have five different video cameras. I have two on my roof, and this is my roof cam. Gives me a nice, this one gives me a 120 degree view, and this is a handheld shot. I kind of really zoom in and get an idea of this tornado now. I prefer chase tornadoes over open fields because you don't want people to be in danger of harm. So luckily there wasn't too much damage with these tornadoes, but the tornadoes were very close to Dodge City. They, they dodged the bullet. No pun necessary. <laughs> 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 but yeah, so these, this tornado outbreak began a little bit before six and went on for quite a while. I won't show you the whole continuous video, but this is a, just a really neat shot here being able to just see all the dirt getting kicked into this tornado here. And there were a few times where it looked like the tornado was going to lift and kind of dissipate, and it would lift and then touch back down. You'll see that in a little bit here. Yeah, it's kind of disintegrating, kind of falling apart. Uh, maybe it's over, maybe not. But there's so much low-level wind shear at this event that it, these storms just kept. There were with over a dozen tornadoes in the, in the region. The data just kept going. So this is later in the life cycle. That first tornado is kind of skipping up and down. Um, and as I'm going, my goal is to get closer and closer. So I'm still about a mile away here at this point. But this is at this point, my chase crew is still one of my closest. At this point, I'm like a couple hundred, or maybe about, mostly about a half mile away, but. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of chasers out this day, so I wasn't, wasn't alone on this chase, but. Took a turn north here to get a little bit of a closer look, and this is what I got, like, uh, within a few hundred yards. This, at this point, this is the closest I ever been to a tornado, which is kind of almost unreal to see this, to see the tornado spinning at a very relatively slow speed. Pace. It was only moving about 10 to 15 miles per hour, kind of erratically. It was moving a little bit to the north and moving to the northwest. But because it was moving so slow and the road network was favorable, I was able to get closer and closer. And that was, that was my goal here to get as close as possible <laughs> while still being safe. If you want to drive directly, you know, I, I drive, I always start hammering my chase. So I don't have like a dominator or a or anything. So. But it is fuel efficient, so that helps me out. <laughs> but, um, and I was chasing with Ian Livingston, some of you guys may know him, writes for Capital Life Gang. He's chasing through here, so. 
looking at radar, GPS, handling my cameras, and just being safe with other drivers around me. So, this is another very slow moving tornado. Just that, that outflow boundary. These tornadoes would just kind of latch onto the boundary and just drift with it to the north. And this was the closest I ever got to a tornado. tornado. You'll see here how close I get. Yeah, we actually have to find where it was a road. <coughs> the police had blocked off the road, and we were able to just kind of sit here and watch this large tornado just kind of slip. And, just, kind of... and that's not a cop, it looks like over here, but it's actually another chaser. So. <laughs> <laughs> And then, well, this is, not, this is the second tornado. There's a low walk on it. It may be hard to see because it's raindrops. Like there's, 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 you, would, you would occasionally get a brief tornado or a funnel that would come out of that. So I kind of lost track after a while, but I estimated there were at least eight tornadoes I saw in these videos. There may have been a lot more. He had things was over a dozen. A little more conservative, but it doesn't really matter when you're this close to a tornado. So yeah, this is some handheld footage here. <coughs> Just remarkable. But luckily, like I said, it was over pretty much open country, so there wasn't a whole lot of damage. But at this point here, so we're moving north, we're only about maybe 10 or 15 miles southwest of Dodge City, which is one of the biggest cities in western Kansas. So we were kind of concerned, you and I, that these tornadoes along the outflow boundary would end up impacting the city, and that would not have been a good case. There were, there were a couple of tornadoes that did the western part of the city, but they dodged. There you go, Cameron. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't as bad as it could have been. Exactly. But yeah, so the second tornado is it's beginning to kind of become narrower, and they call it roping out when it gets small and kind of dissipates. There's a new one trying to come over here, and we're fighting with robots. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some chases would go around the police. I decided as a sheriff right here. I, I, I try to play out a little too quickly, so we didn't get too close. But. Yeah, let's see here, and there's our second tornado. That's Everything blew up right over Dodge City, but 
luckily for the city, everything was a little bit to the west and a little bit to the southwest. So it wasn't as bad there as it could have been. And here are the tornado tracks. Here's Dodge City, so that third string of the cyclic cell was just missed as it hit her. But here's our, we started in this row, we saw that first tornado, and then the second one. And we eventually had the kind of detour. It was even non tornado damage from wind <coughs> over here as well. So we ended up going around here. And we saw this tornado, but it was just so small that it's not even worth really showing the footage. But. So, kind of to summarize chasing, and there's a whole lot of patience, there's a lot of time spent analyzing weather maps, and yep, a lot of time spent driving, and then just when you get to your chase party, you may have to wait several hours for storms to fire. There's many dangers, just like talking about. Not only the storms themselves, but traffic, other chasers, trees, flooding, debris. There's literally a lot of things that go through my mind to try to stay safe when I storm chase. And then you may ask when and where to storm chase. Well, if you want to storm chase the plains, really mid-April through June is probably the peak, the peak tornado season. If you chase later in the season, like I was able to this year, the northern plains are really the Midwest, so Dakotas, Minnesota, Iowa. That's more July and August as the jet stream moves north. If you have that big southeast ridge, it's usually just hot and dry over Oklahoma and Texas. And then later in the season, there's sometimes fall outbreaks. And those are mostly targeted on the plain in the Midwest, but sometimes Pixie Alley. And every now and then there'll be a couple of tornadoes here in the east, too. That's it.